Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're interested in breaking into product management to supercharge technology to improve the lives of others, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is the sole product manager for one of LinkedIn's enterprise product lines. But before I introduce you to Alex Valetis, who graduated in December 2016 with a sub 3.0 GPA, let me repeat, a sub 3.0 GPA and a double major in computer science and economics, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out bright and early on Mondays with unique insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign-up box is right there. Now, my aspiring product managing pour-over lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Alex Valetis, the product lead of Elevate, one of LinkedIn's enterprise product lines with 12 dedicated engineers. Prior to joining LinkedIn in November 2018, Alex spent about a year and a half at Intuit. That was actually his first job after graduating in December 2016. And he started off working as a product manager, leading a team and building a notification platform that powered smart notifications all across Intuit, touching over 50 million consumers and 2.2 million small businesses. While at Intuit, Alex also worked as a product manager of the iOS revamp of Mint that allows users to track bank credit card investment and loan balances and transactions through a single user interface. And finally, Alex is also the author of a brand new book called Modern College, Choose Your Path, Get a Degree, Land Your Dream Job. We are going to be discussing Alex's new book and what he does in his PM role at LinkedIn in our main Time for Coffee interview. So please check out show notes to see if that episode has already dropped. Alex, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Yes, I am. Perhaps even a little too caffeinated, but definitely enough for the interview. So let's get into it. Okay. Well, in my book, Alex, there is no such thing as being (laughs) over caffeinated. So it is all good. And we are going to dive into our 10 espresso shots, which we're framing around product management in the tech space. How does that sound? Sounds great. Let's do it. Okay. So first espresso shot, what entry level jobs are available to young people who want to get into product management? Yeah, it's a great question. So the first advice I always give to people that want to work in the product and product management is to actually not start directly in product management or pursue that route. Most often, the best way to get in is to start in some partner role, such as software engineering or maybe biz ops, and then try to work your way in. So that's exactly how I got in. At Dell, I was a software developer working with a product manager, talked to my product manager, and was able to convert. So that, in my experience, has been the best way to get in as an early career product manager. I'm glad that you just mentioned both product development in the same sentence as product management. It might be helpful for some of our viewers and listeners who may not be as familiar with this vernacular, what the distinction between those two is. Definitely. Yeah, it's certainly a somewhat ambiguous role, I think, in comparison to other roles in the tech space. But at a high level, what a product manager does is I sit between all the different functions, whether it's the designers, the engineers, our marketing team. And essentially, we are the connective tissue that helps take all these different inputs, use it to make product decisions and build a roadmap, and then disseminate information out to all the different stakeholders along the way. So on a given day, I can go from being extremely focused on kind of the go-to-market and how do we partner with our marketing partners to put together a 
comms plan that makes it appealing to users to another day I might be heads down with the engineering team trying to solve a more technical issue. So it's definitely a versatile role. A big difference between you know product management and what I was doing as like a software developer or engineer early in my career is that when you're an engineer and developer, you were completely hands-on. You were actually creating the code or if you're a designer, creating the designs that are used. And I have a unique role in that. I don't actually create any of these things, but rather I partner with them to help unlock our team to do their jobs to the best of their capacity. So you're almost like conducting a little bit of an orchestra. And it's your role to make sure that everyone is in sync and alignment rather than playing an instrument, so to speak. I love that analogy. And in fact, that is what was going through my mind. So you beat me to the punch. Excellent. (laughs) Alex, what is a hard and soft skill that you look for in the young people that you hire at LinkedIn? Definitely. So I'll give one of each. So for a soft skill, I'll sum it up as the ability to influence through communication. And specifically, this is storytelling. So much of my role is not through authority, as in I don't have the autonomy to just tell people we have to do this. But it's rather, how do I influence the stakeholders around me to get behind a vision? So when I look at a young professional, that ability to basically tell a story, whether it's in a format like this or an interview, to me is a very good indication if they'll be able to do that with a wider team. A second skill that's more of a hard skill, I think, is can you either A, do something around prototyping design, the ability to spin up or exercise design thinking, I think is a very good hard skill. And another one is that, especially when you work at a company like LinkedIn, where you have this massive platform with a ton of data at your disposal to help make the products better, the ability to actually go and synthesize that data or to query against that data is another hard skill that I think would be a great thing to come into the product management space with. Okay, that is a perfect segue to my next question. Does somebody's major matter if they want to get into product Mm -hmm. management? Should they study computer science the way that you have? Should they study engineering? Is there a particular major? Or can they kind of hack their way there? Can they take classes on general assembly? Can they study in their own time? Yeah, it's it's hard to give a one-size-fits-all answer here because there truly are different paths for everyone. And my path might not be the same one that everyone else takes. But I'll get to like kind of the crux of your question of is your major a factor? It's absolutely a factor within product management. And I think there are certainly certain different majors that align well. So anything in the software space, whether it's computer science or human computer interaction, those majors are going to naturally give you some of these hard skills I was talking about before to bring into the space. That being said, you know, I've, some of the best product managers I've seen have liberal arts degrees, and they've basically found a way to append other hard skills to this great background of soft skills and interpersonal communication and even philosophy. So there isn't necessarily one path in particular. You can definitely find your way. However, I will caveat that with certain product management roles, especially at more of these technical-driven companies like Google and the Stripes of the world. They will give you pretty hard technical interviews, and it it would be hard to pass that objective technical interview if you don't have the experience that a more technical degree would give you. So sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it means everything. Okay, fair enough. What about a grad school degree, Alex? And maybe less so for entry-level positions, more so for somebody who wants to get into the C-suite. How essential is it to have a grad school degree? And if so, which do you think are the most useful to get? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've done a lot of thinking about the future of higher education as part of the book I wrote. If you look at the C-suite at LinkedIn, for instance, as anecdotal evidence, there is a, I'd say, critical mass of executives at LinkedIn with a secondary degree. A lot of times that secondary degree is a master's of business administration or MBA. It is my personal feeling that with the internet changing the way 
people learn and sort of this, I don't know if I, I want to call it a house of cards, but I do think the sort of curtains have been pulled back on higher ed. I do believe in the future, we will see less and less people with graduate degrees moving into either product management or executive roles at tech companies in general. So I would caution anyone from going to get a grad school degree strictly because you feel like you want to go into it. That being said, I think an MBA or grad school in general, one of the benefits it provides is it's a chance to refocus and recalibrate around what space are you into. So it's a pretty common path nowadays for people that might be in more financial related or say like consulting that decide they want to break into tech. They use the MBA as sort of a recentering point to focus on the skills that map to tech better and then go into it. So I have seen a lot of people with MBAs in particular done the career shift into product management with that MBA as sort of a vehicle to take them there. What about the reverse? What about those who are in product management and might want to map to finance? Is that necessary? Do you think the MBA can be useful if they want to take that kind of a career pivot? Yeah, I think, you know, in general, it gets back to what's the value of this time. And it's it's a time to sort of reflect on the skills you have and the new ones you want to gain. And it's also a chance to expand your network. So I think regardless of whether you're trying to go into product management or leave product management for another field, that time could certainly be valuable to sort of recalibrate and focus yourself on a new path. So if you feel like you're ever in this point where the career isn't working out for you and you want to do a shift, I do think there can be benefit to taking that time to learn. Fair enough. So I know you have devoted a significant part of your book, Modern College, to extracurriculars. And my next question has to do with life experiences, which I think are extracurriculars. They are speaking foreign languages, travel, all of these kinds of things. What do you think, Alex, are the most useful life experiences that our young viewers, our young listeners should try to cultivate while they are still in college to maybe give them a leg up in trying to land a position at a place like LinkedIn in product development? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And and so one thing I always emphasize with college students, particularly people that want to get into my field, is start a project of your own that allows you to practice these skills. So while I was in college, I worked on like a number of different startups or projects. And how they all started was I would take a problem and I would try to build a solution or service around it. So my first project was that I realized the gyms on our campus were often way too full. It was hard to ever get on the equipment you wanted. And it felt like people came in these like sort of waves. And so I partnered with another engineer on campus who had started working on this app. And essentially, it told on the app how many people were in a given space in the gym at any point in time. And these students could actually come in and look at the app and say, okay, it makes more sense to come in in like an hour. And through that, I learned skills like, how do you help build a good mobile product for people? Okay, we built it. How do we get people to actually go download it? And we would put flyers up around campus and we would like sit down and talk to students. So in a lot of ways, those are the skills I still do every day in my job. Granted, it's at a lot more scale where at my campus, I was dealing with maybe hundreds or thousands of students. We now deal in the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions at LinkedIn. But having that early sort of autonomy to do the project on my own and practice these skills was crucial. And it was also the first thing I would talk about in interviews when they would ask these very questions of, when have you ever done this before? That is fantastic advice. So primarily, you are suggesting that they try to launch some kind of a startup while they are still in school. Absolutely. And I think one of the benefits of kind of our society today, if you will, is that the barriers to entry or the friction to starting everything is extremely low. If you want to create a website, there's tools that will essentially take away and abstract all coding. and You can get a landing page up and running in a few days. Take my book, for instance. I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't partner with a major publisher. But with Amazon and their Kindle Direct publishing tools, I was basically able to upload this finalized file. And they took care of distribution. They took care of marketing on the website. So many of these things were done for me. So I highly encourage students to give it a shot. It oftentimes is less 
work and sort of friction than they would expect. But there's no reason not to do it nowadays because you'll always learn something, even for the ones that you deem as a failure in the short term, you'll look back and say, those were actually some of my best learning experiences. Oh, I agree 100%, Alex. So speaking of what you're doing now, and I'm sure that there is a lot of success and failure among your team and in trying out new products, building new products, what would you say is the best part of your job right now as product lead on Elevate at LinkedIn? Definitely. Yeah. So it's, it's been a great time. And, you know, speaking of like Elevate, it, it's also been a challenging one because Elevate is this standalone enterprise product that works in the space of employee advocacy. And it essentially helps companies to get their employees to be active on social media in trusted and safe ways. And we're actually in the process of a pretty quick transformation where we're actually going to fold it into LinkedIn and give it away for free. So while this obviously means some disruption internally, we believe long term, it's going to unlock a ton of value. And this experience, I think, has brought to light both the best and the worst aspects of my job. So the best parts of that, I truly love seeing all different parts of the process. The fact that in a given day, I can look at the designs, work on a technical solution, talk to our marketing team talk to customers. These are all experiences that like, if I didn't have access or the context to any of them, I think it would make each one of those individual experiences feel a little less fulfilling. And also, obviously, when we release something to customers, it's just really cool to log into an app that I personally love using in LinkedIn and see something and be like, wow, we built that. Our team built that. So that's definitely the highs. I think the lows is what I would describe as kind of like janitorial duties. Basically, anything that falls between the cracks of a different function on the team, I pretty much am expected to do. So, you know, if there's some tracking that needs to be done or something breaks, more often than not, I'm the first one to notice it and take an action on it. So, that definitely adds, I think, a lot of stress, a lot of work. But again, it's it's always fulfilling to see it when it's finally out there. And every time I feel like I'm ready to give up on it, we launch something new and you see it out there and it gives you that lifeblood you need to get up and do it again. Awesome. What a great example. So just a few final espresso shots, Alex. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten? Before I worked at LinkedIn, I worked at a company called Intuit. They do a lot of the popular products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, which I worked on. And during our time there, I actually had the opportunity to talk to LinkedIn's former CEO, Brad Smith. He was a CEO there for about 10 or 11 years, one of the best CEOs in Silicon Valley. And one of the things he said to me early on was he said, early in your career, take the important jobs that no one wants to do. And at first, I was like, that feels like weird advice. And I was like, is he basically just telling this to every new grad to take on you know, these kind of crappy roles so that you know the company can keep running. But having taken on a few of these roles where you sort of are an underdog and more established people weren't there, I learned that it's actually an opportunity to stand out. So the first thing is that when you take on a really difficult role, leadership at the company looks at you and says, look, if this person was able to take this really hard, challenging thing and do something good with it, imagine what they can do with something that's already got this momentum. And I think the second thing is it, it gives you an opportunity to stand out. So when I was at Mint at one point, they were really confused with the product direction. And there was a point that I was the only product manager on this app with over 10 million users. And so what that essentially did is it gave me this massive sort of sandbox to hone my skills. And when we did finally turn it around, I was the only product person there for this massive launch. So again, Brad Smith, one of the smartest and best leaders I've ever had the pleasure of speaking to take the hard job that no one wants to do. Love it. And actually, while you were at Intuit, you got the Product Excellence Award. So props to you there. And you were and have been, I guess, a LinkedIn, what is a UED rock star? Yeah. So one thing that I think all these companies do really well is they, they basically will take a chance to spotlight people for doing certain things. And one thing that was cool about Intuit was that they took a, the time to basically recognize these longer projects. So 
one of the projects we worked around notifications, I actually, I left to go to LinkedIn there, but it was awesome to cheer on the team that was working on this notifications platform for so long. And I was there for a sliver of the time, but they, they essentially never gave up on this idea of, could we build a smart notification platform that goes across all their products? And it was really cool to actually see. And, you know, in some ways it would have been nice to stick around and be part of it with them, but they actually got the Scott Cook Innovation Award while they were over at Intuit. And so some of the people over there, Push Paraj, Ilongavan, they just, they showed what happens when you stick with something. And I think that's something that both LinkedIn and Intuit do extremely well is that they highlight people when they do great work. So what is the UED Rockstar? Yeah. So at LinkedIn, they have this award where if you're basically a good partner with different designers or different functions, they'll essentially like highlight it once a quarter. So again, we had done a pretty massive design change on the LinkedIn front. So it's basically their chance to recognize the work that you've done towards that. Nice. What does UED stand for? Oh, that's actually a great question. So I get very caught up in the vernacular sometimes. But essentially, UED stands for user experience design. And so when we think of design, a lot of people think of it as just sort of the icons on the screen. There's really so much that goes into it. Everything from the interviews you do with customers in order to get to the insights to, you know, these usability tasks where you have people actually play with a prototype and then the final design. So essentially at LinkedIn, we put this emphasis on being a really good partner and making sure that whole process is really invested in beginning to end because this is how you get the best experiences. And whether you know you're using Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn, most of the products feel extremely smooth and there's a ton and ton of effort that went into getting it to feel just right and be so really gratifying to use. No doubt. Two final espresso shots. Is there a movie or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon show or book, Alex, that you think best represents, best depicts what this field is really like? Definitely. So there's a show on HBO. It's called Silicon Valley. And it's kind of like a satire type show where essentially it's a couple of people working in a startup in the tech space in general. And what I like about it is that it's extremely over the top. And sometimes it's over the top in a way that's completely false. But the irony is that other times it's over the top in a way that's completely true. So for instance, they have like self-driving cars in it. And one of the episodes, one of the people on the team get like trapped in the self-driving car and it like drives like him five hours in the wrong direction. And it feels very like, you know, satire and like not real. But then Wait, I did remember, he actually like, end up getting put in one of those shipping yeah. containers? Yeah, I saw that. He got put in a shipping container. And it's it's hilarious. And you're like, oh, like no way these robots and stuff would ever do this. And then I remember a few weeks after seeing that episode, I was on Intuit's campus at the time and we had these little robots that would actually deliver food. So you'd have these little like robots on wheels that were like spinning around. And I remember like one time it actually like hit someone on accident. I was like walking, you saw them like kind of jump and it it made me laugh because I was like, you know, maybe this isn't as, you know, fake and like exaggerated as it seems in the show when I have robots, you know, running over people's feet and stuff on my own campus. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that show. It's hilarious. Okay. Final espresso shot. What do you think Java junkies would be surprised to learn about this industry? Definitely. So I think on an industry front, what a lot of people would be really kind of blown away by is the true scale at which a lot of these companies operate. So at LinkedIn, we're around 700 million members. And I think we as humans struggle to process a number that large. But you really start to feel it when you're traveling around, maybe not even in the same country, but in another country, and you hear someone reference LinkedIn. And you're like, wow, this, this person on the whole so- other side of the planet you know, is talking about this feature that someone I know personally built. And I think that's when it truly starts to hit you that software in general is able to operate at this massive scale that I don't think we would have ever dreamed of a few decades ago. In terms of the role of a product manager, I think 
something that would surprise a lot of people is that I don't actually manage direct people right now. So when people hear the, you know, the word manager involved with any role, I think they naturally have some assumptions that like, oh, they must have like a fleet of people working directly under them. And at the higher levels of product management, that's absolutely true. But for a lot of entry level product managers, you're essentially responsible for the product, but you don't actually have direct authority over people. And that's why I think it's actually a great role to start in because you learn to lead by influence first. And if you can learn to lead through influence, when you have the authority, you will be a much better leader, in my opinion. It actually, it sounds fascinating. It really does. It sounds uh, like a field that a lot of folks should should consider exploring. Absolutely. Alex, I want you to hold up your book and let our viewers see it. Alex's new book is called Modern College. Choose your path, get a degree, land your dream job. Check out show notes or the bio to see if Alex's main time for coffee interview has already dropped. That's where we're going to be digging into modern college and tapping Alex's expertise as somebody who just graduated in December of 2016 and has been in the job market actually before he graduated and now obviously for the last four years. Alex, thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T for C community. This was just wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea, and look forward to listening to the episode. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.